Welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Leslie Popoff. I'm currently the president of PCUN, more formally known as the Psychology Coalition of NGOs having consultative status with the UN Economic and Social Council. It is my honor to welcome you all to the 14th Annual Psychology Day at the United Nations and the second one to be held virtually since the start of the pandemic. Welcome distinguished UN delegates and representatives, psychologists, students of psychology, NGO members, and those from the private sector. This annual event provides a unique opportunity to share the activities that psychologists are engaged in at the United Nations, the role of psychological science in addressing concerns of global importance, and how psychology organizations are collaborating with and supporting the UN's agenda and the attainment of the Sustainable Development Goals. We are grateful for the international reach this virtual event has allowed for, with participants from all over the world and every continent. This program will be recorded and made available on the Psychology Day and PCUN websites, making it possible to reach many more. PCUN is the organization responsible for planning and organizing this important event. The coalition's mission is to inform and advocate for the application of sound psychological principles to promote human rights and health and well being for all people throughout the world. Psychology Day at the UN has addressed a wide range of global challenges each year since its inception in 2007, including gender equality, social justice, climate change, the global migration crisis, disaster response, and conflict resolution. We continue to face all of these challenges and more, including the COVID-19 pandemic. The devastation caused by this pandemic cannot alone be measured in the nearly 3 million deaths globally. The resulting severe economic impact and unprecedented curb on social interaction resulting in social isolation for many has had a marked impact on the mental health of people of all ages, including a significant rise in depression and anxiety disorders. Every crisis presents an opportunity for growth. The devastating impact of this pandemic has required a collaborative global response as was critical for the development of life-saving vaccines. As a global society, there is an increasing awareness that rebuilding the status quo is not sufficient. Rather, our investment needs to be in building a better, more inclusive and resilient world. Psychology Day at the UN is truly a team effort and could not be realized without the support of our mission co-sponsors. The permanent mission of Palau to the UN has been a co-sponsor of Psychology Day from the beginning. The permanent mission of the Dominican Republic has also been a co-sponsor and a supporter for a number of years. And we are grateful for the co-sponsorship of the permanent mission of Mexico to the UN. PCUN's program committee has worked tirelessly to create a program that is relevant and important. The three program co-chairs leading this effort this year are Dr. Walter Reichman, Dr. Janet Siegel, and Dr. Comfort Asanbi. Dr. Asanbi will provide some background and context to today's theme. She is an associate professor of psychology at the College of Staten Island of the City University of New York and a representative of the American Psychological Association to the United Nations. Welcome, Dr. Asanbi.
Thank you very much. Uh, greetings from New York to our psychology colleagues and friends who are joining us from the United States and North America, from South America, from Europe, from Africa, my homeland, from the Middle East, from Asia, from Australia, and the South Pacific, and the South Pacific region, and from the nook and corner of the world. My name is Comfort Asambe, an appointed representative of the American Psychological Association, APA, to the United Nations. I am a co-chair of this year's Psychology Day at the UN event. The world has demonstrated a lot of resilience during the COVID-19 pandemic, but the battle to end the pandemic is not over. As vaccinations against the virus offers the greatest hope when it becomes available to the majority of the global population, the United Nations is looking beyond the immediate crisis to plan for a better world as it did at its founding in the midst of the Second World War. To this end, the UN Secretary General has outlined a plan to save lives, protect societies, and recover better, while emphasizing that the world should not simply return to the way it was before the pandemic. The theme of this year's conference is psychological contributions to building back better in a post-pandemic world. And the topic was chosen to reflect how the global community should be reimagined so that we might build a better world where all recovery efforts are implemented through the lens of human rights. The topic also aligns with the UN Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development Goals, SDG 1, SDG 3, SDG 4, SDG 5, and SDG 8. At the world stage, psychological perspectives can advance global discourse and contribute to deliberations as social policy discussions that seek to address human challenges usually involve psychological analysis. Today, five distinguished experts from various sub-disciplines of psychology from three continents, we examine the role of psychology in addressing some of the COVID-19 related issues. This year's event gives these scholars an opportunity to engage with the global community in an effort to assist the UN to move more effectively and to be able to respond to the challenges of a post-pandemic world. Innovative research findings from a developmental psychologist can throw light on the future of parenting and how to reimagine education in a post-COVID-19 world. Oftentimes, marginalized groups appear to have been forgotten in the global collective consciousness, and a clinical psychologist can address ways in which to expand and improve mental health services for all individuals, as well as equitable treatment in low resource communities. A social psychologist can provide research informed best practices designed to reduce violence against women and eliminate the virus of hate, and in the process, achieve social justice. Finally, a health psychologist can address contemporary knowledge that can inform behavioral practices with applied value to improving all aspects of health and wellness. The aggregate of psychological theories 
empirically based research findings and psychologists unique understanding of human behavior and how to effect behavioral change will add meaningful contributions to the UN's attempt to finding solutions to the post pandemic issues. I hope to see you again toward the end of today's event. Now let's get the program going and I hand you over to my colleague, Dr. Kenneth Sigo. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Janet Siegel and I am a representative of the International Council of Psychologists at the United Nations. And I'm very pleased and proud to be a co-chair of this 14th annual Psychology Day at the United Nations. It is my honor to introduce Mr. Suli Sano, who is the counseling minister in the permanent mission of the Dominican Republic to the United Nations. He will give brief remarks. Thank you. Distinguished participants at this 14th Annual Psychology Day at the United Nations. Distinguished guests, it has traditionally been an honor for the permanent mission of the Dominican Republic to co-sponsor this important event, which serves as recognition of the enormous task carried out by professionals in the field of psychology. This year's event comes to be even more significant given the challenges that humanity in general has faced in the last period of time due to the effects of the pandemic. In this sense, the main subject of your event on building a better world beyond COVID-19 is completely pertinent. This is why it's so important to recognize the enormous role played by psychology professionals. On behalf of Ambassador Jose Blanco and the permanent mission of the Dominican Republic, allow me to salute your contribution and to thank you for your efforts to alleviate the consequences, not only physical, that have affected so many people. We hope that this event will conclude with well-deserved success. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sano. Uh, my name is Walter Reichman, and I have the pleasure of introducing the next section of this webinar. Uh, and I'm going to introduce it by introducing the moderator who will then present the participants and run the question and answer section. I am totally honored to introduce His Excellency, the Ambassador from Canada to the United Nations, Richard Arbeiter. He is the Ambassador and Deputy Permanent Representative of Canada to the UN. And besides that, he is a renowned international diplomat. We are honored to have you, sir. Your Excellency, the virtual world awaits you. Well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Reichman. Thank you for, for having me back. Um, as you know, and, and some of your colleagues know, I had the privilege of moderating a session pre-COVID uh, a couple of years ago, a couple of years, but feels like maybe a decade ago. Um, and it was, a, it was focused on gender equality, but it was a wonderful opportunity um, for me and the other participants to really benefit from the research and expertise that's available in this community. And that frankly, you know, we don't have exposure to those of us here at the UN uh, as often as we, as, as we should. Um, I wanted to just thank the organizers for um, making a virtue of the virtual opportunities <laughs> that are available and, and not letting this conversation be another casualty of, of COVID. Um, I've been watching the participants uh, list kind of climb up at the bottom of the screen there. We're now north of, of 700, uh, 721, um, which is almost double the capacity of the room that we would have had at the UN. Um, and so that to me is, it's just a, rem a remarkable uh, representation, both of the, of the interest, but of the ability of this community to uh, harness the technology that's available um, and try to get uh, a real conversation going. Um, we are online today, so I'll just 
give a couple of rules of the road before moving into our first uh, our first presentation. Um, uh, there will be a Q&A and we will seek uh, to have as interactive a discussion as we possibly can. Um, you will be invited to submit questions um, in the, in the Q&A, either via the chat or the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, you can do so during the presentations if you like, um, or at the end of them. Um, I would simply ask you to, if, uh, to indicate whether your question is dedicated to a particular presenter so that we can um, direct that question to them, or if it's uh, directed to all of our presenters, that's fine too, but just let us help, uh, let us help manage that session to make it as uh, impactful for you as possible. Um, to the panelists, you know this, but I will give you a warning uh, when you hit the 13 minute mark, a two minute warning uh, to let you know that it may be time to, to wrap up. Uh, I will introduce each of the panelists in turn ahead of their presentations. I won't do it now, but one, uh, one at a time. Um, but I would also uh, encourage you to review their full bios, um, which are available uh, online uh, as, as well. Um, and then the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll say, um, just because we do indeed have so many participants from all over the world, uh, is just my own private reflection that while COVID is a, is a common global experience, um, your experience of it is very individual uh, and is dictated by the, the local context in which you have. Um, and so this opportunity to really understand uh, you know, expertise that's available globally and how it might resonate for each of us uh, individually in our local contexts uh, is really uh, uh, something that I uh, personally cherish and that I hope that um, each of you will uh, get a lot out of. So with that having been said, um, we'll now move into our, uh, our panelists. Uh, and it's my honor to first introduce Dr. Marina umashi Bears, who is a professor and chair at the Elliott Pearson Department of Child Study and Human Development at Tufts University with a secondary appointment in the computer science department. She directs the Interdisciplinary Development Technologies DevTech Research Group. Her research involves the design and study of innovative learning technologies to promote children's positive development, most specifically in early childhood. I now turn the floor to Dr. Umashi Bears. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited. And it's a unique opportunity to be sharing uh, my research with a group of psychologists and people who care about the well-being of others. So I'm going to share my screen with all of you. And I'm going to start by saying that uh, I'm not a psychologist myself. My training was as a computer scientist. And I'm originally from Argentina. But the reason I, I, did, I did my PhD here, and then I've been at Tufts, which is a university in Boston, in, uh, in the Boston area for the last 20 years as a professor. But the reason I chose to be not in primary in a computer science department, but in a, a child study and human development department is because I want technology to have an impact in the lives of children and in the lives of parents and teachers and all those who care about children. So today I'm gonna to give you a flavor of what we do at DevTech. So we are a fairly big research group, around 20 people work in my lab. And we do all kinds of things. First, we design technologies and those technologies, we care that they go out into the world. So they become products. We don't just want prototypes, but we want people to be use our technologies and our technologies that I design in a way that are developmentally appropriate for young children. We have Scratch Junior, which is a free app, which right now is used almost in every one of your countries, 32 million users all over the world, designed for children four to seven years old. And then Keyboard Robot, which also allows you to learn uh, about technology, but without screens, with wooden blocks. And I'll be sharing a little bit about both of these. So of course we have a pedagogical approach of how we're gonna use technologies in the classroom, not only to promote the learning of computer science and engineering, but how we're going to promote positive youth development. So at the end of learning how to code, we can all become happier and better human beings. The third thing we do is, of course, we conduct research and we do from brain imaging to understand what happens on the brain when children code, to develop curriculum, to one-on-one -on -one studies, 
And we do a lot of outreach. We work with teachers and parents and communities uh, all over the world, bringing our technologies and our approaches and conducting studies. So this is a picture of a classroom in the 1800s, right? And you have some technology there. You have a blackboard. And if you look at this, which is a picture of a classroom, uh, you know, maybe from the 2000s, is not much has changed. The technology has become a little more fancy. Now they have computers instead of books and they have a screen, but the way the classroom is organized is very much the same. And uh, you can see it's very interesting how children give the back to each other. Uh, and that's very telling about the kinds of social and emotional learning that happens in these classrooms. And of course, suddenly last year, all of us were faced in the world of education with this. Suddenly the classrooms that we knew became on the screen and everyone had the challenge as a teacher, as a parent of how to help their children uh, navigate a, a learning experience that was happening only on the screen. And so what is the role of technology? What is the role of technology for education? Is it just to deliver information? Or is it to help form communities and interact with each other? Well, at the end of my talk, you're going to tell me where do you think I stand on this. So we use uh, the metaphor to understand the role of technologies. I use the metaphor of a playground. Why the playground? The playground is a space where you see a lot of creativity, a lot of uh, movement, social interaction, learning how to manage conflict, uh, learning how to uh, create social interactions. Children have certain degree of autonomy. The adults are in the background in case there is safety issues, but pretty much every area of human development that we learn in child development one-on-one, -on -one, cognitive development, social development, emotional development, moral development, you name it, happens in the playground. Now contrast this image, this metaphor of the playground with this other one, the playpen. The playpen is a lot more limited. You have usually fewer kids, fewer opportunity for discovery, fewer, fewer opportunities for making mistakes, fewer opportunities for uh, trying things out, for developing language, and the adults are in charge. If I wanna give it, uh, this child something to play with, it's the adult who chooses and gives it to the child. Of course, a playpen is a lot safer unless the child tries to escape, right? But if it doesn't, it's a lot safer. However, in terms of learning, I can leave my child in a playpen for 15, 20 minutes if I need to go out cook, right? But I know I will not spend uh, two hours with my child in the playpen like we do in the playground. So these are two metaphors to think about the role of technologies in, child, in children's lives. And so I'm gonna I'll give you a little bit of homework when all of this session finishes and you go back to your homes, I'm gonna ask you to think around what kinds of technologies in your life are playgrounds and which ones are playpen and which are the differences between them. And as you use any technology, eh, think about that. Of course, our choice is when we think about technologies for learning, we use the metaphor of the playground. That is, we want technologies that have what we call the six C's that promote communication, collaboration, community building, content creation, creativity, and choices of conduct. And the classrooms look very much like this. Nothing like the first pictures I showed you. And this is the fancy terms is PTD, positive technological development based on years on the research on positive youth development. You can read more about that in, in, my, in my latest book, the second edition of my book. But why coding? Why are we thinking about playgrounds and coding? Why do we wanna teach computer science to young kids? Well, computer science is everywhere right now. It's not just these computers. Every time we encounter an object, an object has been programmed and there is no magic. And we want children to start to understand early on this new literacy. So they can start thinking about abstract, logical thinking, creative problem solving, new modes of expression and collaboration. These are the new literacies of the 21st century. 
and they change the way we think, just like the old literacy changed the way we think, and they also inform civic participation. So if you look at the news today, if you don't understand what an algorithm is, you will not know how Facebook or the news that you receive in your mailbox were chosen for you. So what we mean is it's a useful skill for everyone. When we teach computer science starting in early childhood, we don't want everyone necessarily to be, grow up to be a software developer, but we want them to understand what is this about an algorithm. It's just like literacy, everyone who needs to learn how to read and write is not gonna become a professional writer or an academic, but it's a useful skill is the same with a computer science. It's just a way to think in new ways. So how do we do that when you start with young children who do not know how to read and write? And so why also starting with young children? And we know from research uh, done over the years that every program, the earlier you start, the more you, you have a return and the more uh, impact you can have in a country and an economy the earliest you start. So it's the same for programming languages. And we have developed a curriculum and that comes along with our tools that is completely free. That's called coding as another language because we want children as they learn how to read and write in their own new languages. They also learn the artificial language on programming. And uh, what you see here is um, Scratch Junior and which is, uh, which is a free app, all made of symbols and images. And the other is Kibo, which is a robot that you can code. And so if you go to a website, I invite you to do that later after you can get the curriculum. And the curriculum is all based on children's books because we're not talking about replacing old literacies, but to add a new literacy. And there is usually a book about a role model who is a woman in computer science and then a fiction book. And we focus on kindergarten, first and second grade, which is the time where we build literacy and we want this new literacy as well. And it's very simple what the curriculum, we ask children to ask questions, to imagine solutions, to plan for them, to create prototypes, to test and improve their prototypes, to share with the community and to ask with question, new questions. This is the design process. And if you see, it's very similar to the writing process. And I can put any other process here and it will match. So let me give you a little bit of an example. This is Scratch Junior, again, free app that we developed. And you can see this was done by a kid after looking at a, a book about a computer scientist that found a bug. And then she found the bug where computers used to be big, big, big. And that's why it's called debugging. She found the bug in the big machines and took it out. And what you can see is now the bug is going away. And what the, the symbols that you see here is what is controlling the motions of the bug. So down here, you see a green flag. It's going to control your algorithm. And so children can start thinking about logic, steps, orders, without really knowing uh, to read and write. It's very graphical. And here you can see this is a recent uh, video from a school who's hybrid where a five-year-old is very proud showing the program he made. So he had programmed his cat to dance around and to move, and he's showing with his body how it's moving. You can see it's a very complex algorithm with repeat loops, and now he's sharing with his community, with his peers, his project. So we are going to let it, the video finish. You can see that the children, you cannot hear them, but they are interacting. They are asking questions. Uh, they are making comments. Oh. And this is actually a picture from a school in Argentina who's been working with our curriculum all via Zoom and with a teaching coding where kids were in their homes. So Argentina is one of those countries that didn't have school for in present school for almost a year. And they wanted to use technologies in way that were supporting positive youth development and not just playpen style. And so from their homes, they had access to technology and they were a teaching Scratch Junior. So the second technology is this, which doesn't involve screens. However, during the pandemic, it posed more challenges because people were not able to use it. 
But what it is, is you have a five-year-old here who's gonna show you how he programs a robot with wooden blocks. So he's programming the commands, the algorithm, the sequence, and then with the robot, he's scanning them one by one. So no screens here, but you still have the cognitive mechanisms. And then you can see that now the program is saved and the robot is moving. Dr. Bears, I'm just going to give you your two minute warning. Perfect. Thanks. So uh, when taken into a classroom and a classroom like looks like a playground, you incorporate creativity and all kinds of uh, projects. And there you have these girls who created dancers around the world. And you see in the back all other kinds of uh, dancers. So to wrap up, what you saw here is little examples of what we want to see technology. We want technology for communication, for collaboration, for community building, for content creation, for creativity, and for choices of conduct. We are thinking about, when we think about technology, we think about playgrounds because playgrounds are the provide opportunities for development of all of our skills together and not only cognitive skills. So thank you very much. And if you wanna learn about, more about the work or the research or see tons of videos, uh, you can find everything there. Excellent. Well, thank you so much um, for that presentation. Thank you for incorporating the visuals as well. Uh, those metaphors are sticking certainly in, in, in my mind and I will be thinking them through. Um, we'll now move to our second uh, presentation, um, which will be uh, delivered by Dr. Charlene Sen. Uh, Dr. Sen is a professor and Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Sexual Violence at the University of Windsor in my country, in, in Canada. Uh, her research centers on men's violence against women and girls, and since 2005 has focused on sexual violence prevention. She developed the Enhanced Access Acknowledge uh, Act, Sexual Assault Resistance uh, education program. Uh, and now without further ado, let me give the floor to Dr. Sen. Over to you. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here today with you all. So I'm talking to you today about research that's focused on university campuses. Uh, and I focus there because the young, those 14 to 24, are at the highest risk of experiencing sexual violence. And universities therefore provide an ideal context to do the important research to develop and evaluate interventions. But of course, sexual violence is a problem that extends far beyond this and I'll come back to the end. So we have known about this problem for a long time. And unfortunately, the statistics in all of our countries have not changed. It's not that we've not taken any action, but rather that the actions we've taken have not made much of an impact. So we need to move forward in our post COVID world with different strategies, and we need to choose interventions that work. So I, I care as you do about sexual violence experienced by people of all genders and perpetrated by anyone of any gender. However, it's really important to realize that this is a distinctly gendered crime and this needs to influence our approach. The vast majority of victims are women, regardless of race and sexual identity. The vast majority of perpetrators are heterosexual men. So in universities, the most conservative estimates are that one in five young women will experience a rape by the time she graduates from university and that one in 10 young men will have perpetrated a rape by the time they graduate from university. So we need a comprehensive plan for sexual violence prevention and psychological science is critical to ensuring that the things we develop actually work or are abandoned because they should be if they don't work, they are a waste of time and resources. All of my research is part of building effective solutions. 
So in the world, we have a number of goals. And obviously, the first and most important is to end perpetration. But unfortunately, we have not come close to reaching this goal yet. Most of our programs, when evaluated, are not effective or have very limited effectiveness. We also need to change the culture. But culture change takes time. We know that this is something that we are working on and that we hope will have an effect in, in some time. So we can't wait. We need to empower all of our citizens to actually see sexual violence as a problem that is partly their problem, to take, um, to take the action, to intervene when they see that something's wrong and to support survivors. But bystander type approaches are only, which are quite um, effective in changing people's willingness to do this, um, are only um, useful mostly in pre-sexual um, uh, violence situations in advance because they're not present, bystanders are not present in the majority of sexual violence situations. So every day on our campuses and off, women are still being confronted by men who are attempting to sexually assault them. And so we need another goal as well. And that is um, to provide women with knowledge and skills so that they can defend themselves now. The program that I developed, which is the Enhanced Assess, Acknowledge, Act, or EAAA for short, um, Sexual Assault Resistance Program is designed to address this um, problem and this goal. So what is the problem that women are actually experiencing that social psychology can solve? Well, cultural messages about risk of sexual violence focus on public environments and stranger risk. You can think about this in your own um, context. They also focus on women's responsibility to sort of avoid these risks by restricting their own behavior. But the realities of sexual violence are actually um, quite, quite in contrast. Most sexual violence is perpetrated in social settings that should be safe. I'm showing a party situation here because post-party sexual assaults are quite common, but in fact, people's homes are the most common site of sexual violence. And even more importantly, the vast majority of perpetrators are men who are known to women they assault. They are the classmates and friends and intimate partners and neighbors and so on. And this contradiction then creates serious problems. First, that focus on public situations and strangers contributes to increased fear and women taking precautions which restrict their freedom without actually providing increased safety. And that focus also reinforces the idea that sexual violence only happens to other women out there. And so the contradiction means that when danger comes from someone that women know, there's a delay in recognizing that risk or that danger and shock and confusion and doubt of one's own perceptions result. And so the harm continues in that situation and beyond, and women often internalize responsibility and blame. So the program that I developed is a 12 hour, four unit small group intervention. And this is the culmination of more than a decade of research and development with the assistance of amazing undergraduate and graduate students. It's based on social psychological theory and evidence, empirical evidence, as well as best practices and knowledge from feminists involved in our communities in self-defense advocacy and prevention since the 1970s. And the program is designed to reduce the likelihood that young women will experience completed sexual assault when they come in contact with coercive men by decreasing the time it takes to identify a behavior or a situation as dangerous, reducing those emotional obstacles to seeing that danger in known men, and maximizing the likelihood that women will be able to use what we know from research are the things that are more like, most likely to work. And it's designed to do this without elevating women's fear or restricting them in any way. And while being clear that perpetrators are entirely responsible for their own behavior. So now I'm gonna take you through in the very briefest form, the units of the program so you could see how this was put together. So the first unit assess 
makes explicit the violence and power and control in sexual assault. And it explores the research evidence of cues in men's behavior and in situations that indicate elevated danger. And it gives women practice applying that knowledge. Now, you might think this is obvious, but it isn't because, for example, we know that isolation is a risk cue. That is, it increases perpetrator advantages um, and so elevates risk of sexual assault. But this is the kind of situation that many um, women actually uh, visualize when they think of that, the underground parking lot in an urban situation, for example. But this kind of social isolation is the much more common um, situation where um, the um, being um, in an area where there aren't other people and for in this instance where there's loud music which is actually creating a sound isolation if you needed help is more to the point. The second unit acknowledge creates a safe context for um, women to explore their own emotional obstacles to seeing danger in these kinds of situations I've been talking about and strengthening women's trust of themselves when they feel that something is wrong in a situation. Basically, this unit is undoing um, female socialization for nice. The message is trust yourself. You have a right to prioritize your sexual integrity and safety over concerns of, about hurting other people or worrying whether you're harsh. The third unit act contradicts self-defense myths like that women will just be hurt worse if they fight back, which is a myth and presents evidence of the most effective self-defense tactics. And they are leaving, if you can, forceful verbal resistance, yelling, screaming, swearing, and forceful physical resistance. Anything hitting, kick, kicking, punching, biting, any of those things. And young women leave this strategy, this, sorry, this unit um, with a toolbox of escalating strategies that they would personally be willing to use against, against an acquaintance. The fourth unit, relationships and sexuality, is emancipatory sex education that most of us lack. Basically, the young women can figure out what their own desires and values are in a safe environment. And you might be saying to yourself, what does this have to do with sexual assault? Well, the theory is that our, when we're more, we have more knowledge and we're more confident about what we want, it leads to earlier detection of risk. So of course, all of this theory is no good unless it actually works, as I said. So here um, we, I did with my colleagues a multi-site, three universities, randomized control trial where we randomly assign um, young women to either have the control, which is uh, um, all the access to brochures and the knowledgeable person, um, and, or to the program. And we followed them up for two years. And uh, what, you, what you see here is, first of all, the blue line is the control group. And so if you're wondering about this, yes, indeed, this does mean that at the end of one year, um, almost 10% of the young women um, had experienced a completed rape who were in the control group. And the program, EAAA, reduces um, the sexual violence, the completed rapes by 46%. It does also work on other forms of, of sexual violence, um, even greater decreases in attempted rape, for example. If we put those together, that's a 50% reduction. And to bring this home then, this means that only 13 young women would need to have the program um, for there to be one fewer sexual assault. Now you might be saying, okay, she's standing in Canada, um, which women does this actually work for? Um, our research was able to show that the program works for white women and women of color, it works for heterosexual, lesbian and bisexual women, and it works for survivors as well as women who have not had previous, um, have previously experienced sexual victimization. So then how are we actually able to um, accomplish this big reduction? Well, the reason is that social psychology works. So. Um, 
the program is decreases that woman blaming that I talked about earlier and belief in those in those rape myths, including around stranger sexual assault. And it increased women's um, acknowledgement and recognition that they could experience an acquaintance rape. And it is through changing these that actually women's detection of risk became better and faster at earlier stage of coercion. It also increased their knowledge um, and willingness to use those most effective self-defense tactics that I talked about at an earlier stage. And this is critical because the research shows that young women are least likely to use the effective techniques um, with men they know unless they are trained. And it empowers women, it increases their confidence. They could defend themselves if they needed to. But the program does not um, completely eliminate sexual violence. So it's also important that program decreased self-blame if rape did, was experienced. Thank you, Richard. I see you. Okay. <laughs> Two more minutes. Yeah, thank you. So um, the program, I created a nonprofit to get it out in the world after that, after that research, and it is being used on a number of campuses um, in different parts of the world. Um, but it was only available in English. Um, my colleague Isabel Daniel at the University of Montreal um, has been um, we has been leading a French adaptation, and we we're stalled by COVID, but we'll be testing that soon. Prior to COVID, we had actually started to imagine whether it's possible to do this kind of a program um, online. And this is the work is led by Sarah Peitzmeyer. We're just starting theater testing. Um, the program has always been open to trans women, but um, what about other students? And um, this work also led by Sarah Peitzmeyer is, um, is doing the formative research is being done now. But here is the point. We need to get this way beyond universities. And so this is the most important adaptation, which it, with my um, colleague, Sarah Cran, um, we've done an ad adaptation for younger girls right down to 14 in the community. And we were poised to start the randomized control trial when COVID hit. So that's on pause, but will be um, figured out soon. So social psychology is the foundation of my work. It moves us from ideas to building hypotheses based on theories and evidence. And the result is an evidence-based intervention that actually works. And this is only one small part, but one small part of making the world a better place in the post-COVID years. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Sen. Uh, you know, not only has your work, you know, been incubated in, in universities, but, you know, the, speaking about looking at different linguistic adaptations um, and moving it from universities to other settings is really what universities are all about, you know, creating something, doing the research, finding the evidence, and then trying to expand it out into a much broader um, application. So thanks for all the work and the work of your colleagues that you noted at, at other universities as well. Um, we'll now move to our third presentation, um, which will be delivered by Dr. Michael Fries, who is a full professor of management and entrepreneurship at the Asia School of Management in Malaysia, professor of management at Lupana University in Germany, and currently on leave from the University National University of Singapore, where he is provost and head of the Department of Management of the Business School. He was the chair of work in organizational psychology at the University of Gießen and a visiting professor at the London School of Economics. He's a member of the German Academy of Science and a fellow in the Academy of Management, the Society for Industrial and Organizational Psychology, and the Association for Psychological Science. Uh, Dr. Fries, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm delighted to be here um, because I was very much concerned about getting a, a better connection between psychology and the United Nations when I was president of IAP. And as a matter of fact, uh, let me just share one little slide here uh, where we had the first psychology, but not a day, a minute at the United Nations in 2004 when we talked about with APA and, uh, and SIAP, um, how to make use of psychology uh, for United Nations issues. And one of the big issues that of course exist um, is the issue of poverty. And as a matter of fact, uh, given the fact that COVID-19 has increased poverty again, 
it, uh, we have to double down on the um, idea of reducing poverty, particularly in developing countries. And so um, I uh, usually people talk about poverty as being something that is an economic behavior, and obviously it is. Poverty reduction uh, has something to do with finances, but at the same time, I want to argue very strongly that if you lose and forget the psychology about poverty reduction, you probably don't get the real effects. So I start with an article by Harry Trandis in 1984 who talked about psychological theory of economic growth. And I sort of continue on on this, on this path to ask the question, what produces economic and sustainable uh, growth? And uh, there are three sort of uh, areas where the two meet, where economics and psychology in terms of the behaviors meet. And of course, we are talking about behaviors that change things, that improve things, that produce new ideas, and that um, eliminate um, uh, uh, inefficiencies uh, to some extent. And so um, there are three areas where these two areas meet of psychology and economics, and that is hard work, uh, enterprising, efficient organizing. Uh, and of course, the individual prerequisites uh, like achievement motive and deferred gratification and trust and common good orientation and ethics. There are societal conditions and environmental and historical conditions that again have an influence on the individual prerequisites and national culture. On the other hand, of course, uh, we often forget this, these two areas of psychology, individual prerequisites, and these three areas or chunks of behaviors that I want to describe now. These three chunks of behaviors um, are hard work, number one, which is effort, persistence, accepting changing uh, conditions, accepting high goals, aspirations, high achievement motive. The second one, is enterprising and innovating. And I mean this really in a very, very broad sense, not just in terms of starting a company, but also in starting something new within a company, in starting ideas and developing ideas and trying to get them going uh, within a company or within a social sphere. So enterprising and innovating is a general issue and uh, there, uh, there's lots of stuff um, that is going on there in terms of innovativeness, proactive orientation, autonomy, risk-taking, etc. And I will be talking a bit about personal initiative. And then the final part of these three things that combine these two disciplines of economics and uh, psychology is efficient organizing, which implies again a broad area of trust, of leadership, also distributed leadership, of ethical behavior that breeds trust working to, uh, together in good faith, also pragmatism, not blaming for errors, etc. cetera. Uh, so and the issue of hierarchy not being too extreme, but still being there when it's needed. So this is, these are the three areas where we need to combine these two disciplines. Now, um, there are empirical studies in each one of them. Uh, working hard, there's a lot of issues around conscientiousness leading to entrepreneurial success, to career success, to employee performance. There's lots of stuff on enterprising in terms of entrepreneurial orientation, meta-analysis that show that um, these uh, aspects lead to better uh, success of companies, particularly in developing countries. And there's lots of stuff on efficient organizing, um, and I don't need to in describe them in detail. What I do want to very briefly show is that all of these factors matter. So environmental and historical issues, of course, have an influence like ambient temperature and inhabitants of former countries are, tend to be more competitive and poorer. There are complex, more complex uh, um, issues around that um, as shown by Ebert van der Fliet. Um, there are issues around um, uh, uh, developing enterprises from a national culture point of view. And it has been shown by Stefan and Ulana 
that new business rates are uh, related to socially supportive cultures that are high on humane orientation and low on assertiveness or low on aggressiveness. And this of, often holds also when GDP is controlled. And at the final point that I want to describe in a bit more detail is the issue of enterprising as an aspect of personal initiative. Now, we have looked at personal initiative in many different ways, but the important part of personal initiative is that it is an active mindset. It's mindset for action. It's self-starting. So you do something that is not normal, that is not something that everyone is doing already. Um, you don't do the obvious. Uh, you don't necessarily do things that are in the air. You try to differentiate yourself from others in what you're, what you're doing. Future orientation may help you to think about opportunities and problems in the future and to prepare for them now. And preparing uh, for, for these kinds of things helps you to also be self-starting again. And obviously you also need, whenever you do something new, whenever you do something, when you, whenever you initiate it as something, you have to overcome barriers. There are problems you often have not no, you don't know everything about it yet. You have to um, deal with the problem. And sometimes you also have to deal with your own anxieties, your own frustration. So in general, personal initiative and success is correlated in Uganda, in Germany, in China, and in many, many other countries. We have shown that there are correlations between personal initiative and success. So now we do the same thing. Uh, that uh, Charlene just described, and that is uh, we used a randomized controlled field experiment to show whether uh, developing psychological trainings for entrepreneurs, micro entrepreneurs in Africa actually has a positive effect or not. And in which way it is different from a more business oriented, more economic type training that was developed for the developing countries uh, by, a, by a very, very uh, sophisticated um, set of, um, of, of economists. Um, and so we had essentially then three groups. One received a psychological training um, of personal initiative. One received a traditional business training. The business training, and of course the third group was, I'm sorry, the third group was of course a control group. So business edge training um, implied something like accounting, financial management, calculating costs, cash flow management, commercial management and marketing, the four P's of, of marketing, human resource management. There was also an issue of, around the idea of formalizing business. And the personal initiative training uh, was very different. We are, not, we are not trying to give skills of better Pro, uh, better practices of business, we are actually primarily training the mindset of personal initiative, the mindset of self-starting, the mindset of not giving up, the mindset of trying things out, the mindset of uh, all the time asking question, can I improve something and can I try it out the improvement whether it works or not. So innovation and opportunity identification is more important. High goals are important. Financial planning does not imply that I'm trying to get money from a bank. The business edge training was trying to teach people how to get money from a bank. We were not so interested in that part. We were much more interested that people would get feedback, also negative feedback from their environment, that they would overcome barriers and that they would develop a personal project at the end. The result was quite astonishing. Remember, these were 1,500 participants in Togo, 500 in each group. And what you see here is that indeed the personal initiative training increases profits by 57% two years after the training. We had two, uh, four times measurements after the training and it was significantly different uh, from the control group. The traditional business training did not improve profits as much. It was slightly improved, but it was not significantly different. 
the psychological training was actually significantly better also than the traditional business training. Uh, so in some ways then it showed that you really need the psychological part on this intersection between economics and psychology to be developed well. So business training increased good business practices, but, in, but as I said, did not increase profitability. Uh, the psychological appro approach that did a lot of stuff on innovation, on change, personal initiative, on improved offers of products and services. We published uh, uh, much of that study um, in, in, in science in uh, uh, 2017. Just to give you a flavor of what we were doing. Um, and if you, if you think along for a second, uh, how you would act uh, if you were sitting in this in this training, then you can probably see very quickly how it's useful to think about it in detail. We are asking people to think about between nine and 10, what did they do yesterday? 10 and 11, 11 and 12, et cetera, et cetera, every hour. And then we ask them each time, where could you have shown more initiative than you did show? Where did you just react to the situation instead of controlling, influencing, and innovating on the innovation? Where did you just um, uh, give up when there were barriers? And where did you uh, give up when you were frustrated with situations as well? So every hour you look at it and you ask the question, how can I become better in terms of, uh, in terms of showing personal initiative? This was an example of one of those participants in our studies. In this case, it was in Uganda. And the, um, and the idea, and I think Richard is telling me that I should stop in two minutes. Uh, thank you. Um, the idea was for these people here was that they um, had produced cheap aluminum saucepans of low quality. And as a result of the personal initiative training, the entrepreneurs started to be interested in higher quality products that would fetch higher prices. He asked, the remember, one of the things was get negative feedback, learn more from negative feedback. So he went with his saucepans to the National Bureau of Standards and asked for feedback of how they can improve it. He improved, improved, went back, improved, went back. Finally, he got certified. Once he got certified, he got a 10 million Ugandan shilling contract that kept him busy for a year and three of his cooperating firms around him. So we did this kind of personal initiative training in many different kinds of countries. I want to just emphasize how important it is at this intersection to do the psychology as well. Let me just say very briefly how much it is, how much it was nice and good to work in this kind of psychological environment, but also how good and valuable it was to actually work together with the economists, in this case, from the World Bank. So I want to uh, stop at this point and uh, emphasize again how much I enjoy to be here in this really important issue of increasing uh, uh, economic behavior by reducing poverty for uh, small businesses in developing countries. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Fries. I should also thank you because I know it's so much later where you are than where I am. Uh, so thank you for being so animated, uh, notwithstanding the late the late hour. Um, for you listening to your to your presentation, I couldn't help but um, realize that a lot of those principles also apply to the universe of diplomacy <laughs> and what I should be thinking about in terms of you know the units of time that that I have and where initiative um, can be can be taken. Um, so thanks thanks so much again. Well, now move to our, our fourth presentation um, from Dr. Uh, Tama Bryant Davis. Uh, Dr. Bryant Davis is a tenured professor of psychology at Pepperdine University, 
where she directs the Culture and Trauma Research Laboratory, Dr. Tama's Clinical and Research Interest Center on Trauma Recovery for Marginalized Communities. She completed her doctorate in clinical psychology at Duke University and her postdoctoral training at Harvard Medical Center's Victim of Violence Program. She is a past American Psychological Association representative to the United Nations. Dr. Tama also chaired the APA Committee on International Relations in Psychology. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be here. I am reminded of the words from a beautiful group of singers, Sweet Honey and the Rock, who declared, we are the ones, we are the ones we've been waiting for. And indeed, the world is dealing with trauma and loss, and there has been a call issued for psychology to respond. And so I want to talk with you for a few minutes about thriving in a post-pandemic world clinical implications. And I see I need to stop sharing and start sharing again so that the slides will move. I have been used to teaching online for a while now, so we know that this sometimes happens. All right. So it is important that I acknowledge my identity. Who we are shapes our research. It shapes the questions that we ask and the ways we interpret data. I am an African descendant woman, a psychologist who engages in research, education, clinical care, and advocacy. I am located in the United States, living in Los Angeles, and I want to give a land acknowledgement of the indigenous peoples of this land, specifically in Los Angeles, the Tongva peoples who have been and currently are the caretakers of this land. I also want to acknowledge that we are not meeting in isolation or in disconnection from what is happening in the world around us. We are facing multiple traumas, COVID-19 and the societal trauma of oppression. And I want to acknowledge the wonderful work of the emerging scholars, the students in my culture and trauma research lab at Pepperdine University. And we're gonna have that happen again. There we are. So what are the mental health consequences that we discover in the research as it relates to COVID-19? Many people are living with intense fear and that fear is concentrated, especially in areas that have high reports of COVID-19 cases and COVID-19 deaths. Our research has also documented high levels, increasing levels of depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress symptoms. We also notice increases in social isolation, loneliness, eating behavioral changes, and substance dependence. And so each of us experience trauma in unique ways, and we want to be mindful of the ways the distress shows up in us and shows up in our families and our communities. There are specific populations we want to attend to, we want to think about those who had pre-existing psychiatric disorders before COVID-19. And as a result of the trauma and loss of this season, they have experienced a worsening of psychiatric symptoms. We also want to be mindful of frontline workers, essential workers, those in healthcare, those in food service industries, those who are in mental health, those who are also in clergy, report increased decrease increased depression and depressive symptoms, as well as anxiety, psychological distress, and I think many of us can attest to challenges with poor sleep quality. The general public has revealed lower psychological well-being and higher scores of anxiety and depression compared to before COVID-19. So as was raised in the introduction and the framing of today's talk, it is important that we not only talk, to, talk about vaccines and address the physical component, but the psychological component of our recovery and restoration. We want to be mindful of vulnerable populations, those who face increased risk of psychological distress, and those rates have been found increase among women, persons with poor health, persons who have had COVID-19 or currently have it, persons with relatives diagnosed with COVID-19. We want to be mindful of the unique experience of immigrants, the challenges of families with children and racially marginalized communities that have had disproportionate rates of not only cases, but also deaths. 
So there is much work that we can do. And yet we do have the research around trauma and trauma recovery where we can make important contributions to the way forward. I wanna pause for a moment to really reflect on the experience of children and adolescents in COVID-19. We have seen the dynamics change in terms of their support systems and their distress. Children and adolescents globally have demonstrated an increase in anxiety, depression, PTSD, academic difficulties, grief, and loss. While they are facing these challenges, many of them have lacked peer contact and reduced opportunities for stress regulation. So while they used to use play or sports or artistic outlets, Many of those things have been cut off and we want to be mindful of that as we develop and implement interventions. Children and youth during this season have also had increased risk for exposure to parental mental illness, domestic or intimate partner violence and child maltreatment. We wanna give special attention to children and adolescents with special needs, those with disabilities, those who have prior trauma histories, those who already had existing mental health problems, children of migrant backgrounds, those of low socioeconomic status, and racially marginalized youth who are disproportionately affected. While a number of evidence-based models look at trauma recovery for children and for adolescents, I just want to highlight the online art therapy interventions that have been utilized during this time and have been found effective in reducing distress as they combine not only talk therapy, but creative expression. We also want to be mindful for children and especially adults, the need to attend to guilt reduction and grief. Overall, we need to develop greater quality telehealth interventions. Before COVID-19, many of us thought of telehealth as an option that only a few took up, but now most mental health professionals have had to learn how to use their interventions in effective ways online and by phone. Specifically, many people are dealing with guilt in terms of the ethical challenges of not being able to be there for their loved ones while they were sick or while they were dying. This has created great in increases in guilt. And so there's a need for interventions that help people to appraise the actual cause of these stressful events, in fact, COVID-19, that people have had to cope with but want to be released in terms of the self-blame and shame. We also wanna help people think about positive ways to move forward, continuing to live out their values. We also know in terms of cl clinical response that we need to attend to the pervasive grief that many people are facing, whether the person who died was close to them or simply seeing the growing numbers, the large numbers locally, nationally, and globally. There's a need for not only empirically supported trauma interventions, which do exist, but also culturally congruent and culturally emergent interventions. And that is where my, the body of my research lies, looking at cultural context and how we respond to trauma. And so people are facing multiple traumas, traumatic grief, intimate partner abuse, child abuse, race-based stress and trauma that is happening simultaneously to the medical trauma of COVID-19. Many have recommended holistic interventions so that we engage not only in talk therapy, but body-based treatment like dance and yoga, incorporating nutrition, self-help books, play, and the expressive arts. We also find that it's important to look at the integration of spirituality and psychotherapy. The majority of the globe, and particularly there have been research done in Iran, the US and Nigeria, noting that people are applying spiritual and religious themes to the meaning making of COVID-19 and also incorporating religious and spiritual coping strategies. So it's important that we not ignore the spirituality and religiosity that shape the lives of many people, especially those who are racially and ethnically marginalized and particularly women. Some spiritual practices have included breathing relaxation exercises and breathing relaxation helps to improve sleep disturbance, depression and anxiety. Overall, as clinicians and researchers, we want to attend to meaning making, compassion, 
suffering, hope, and the sacred as it plays out in people's lives. It is so important that we also address inequities and injustice. Racism has not been put on pause in the midst of COVID-19, instead it has intensified. And we want to especially acknowledge the anti-Asian racism, the anti-Black racism that has occurred, that has continued historically and is present with us now. Racism creates increases in physical and mental health consequences, and this has been documented in our research. So we need interventions that will honor and recognize the humanity of marginalized people, to use cultural proverbs and storytelling, and to use resistant strategies. That is the difference between liberation psychology and resistance, liberation psychology and Western psychology that we don't just teach people to cope with trauma and oppression, but we teach them to resist and to dismantle it. And some people have referred to this as a need to indigenize psychology or decolonize psychology, to recognize the wisdom that comes from communities predating traditional Western models of psychology. Indeed, culture is medicine. So there are opportunities for growth, we can strengthen relationships in this post pandemic. And even during the pandemic, we can look at post traumatic growth, resilience, resolving conflict, engaging resourceful, creative, and novel health enhancing strategies, and co designing interventions that will move us beyond symptom cessation and actually look at thriving. It's important that we collaborate and expand our reach to include researchers, practitioners, consultants, educators, community members, policymakers, public health professionals, faith leaders, the media, medical professionals, and equity and justice professionals. This is my platform as I am seeking now to serve as president of the American Psychological Association to think about ways we can mobilize as psychologists to really enhance thriving in this post-pandemic world by addressing trauma and loss, rebuilding communities, engaging holistic therapies, integrating the expressive arts, and dismantling inequities and injustice. And so I will close with this quote by Lucille Clifton, come and celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. Come and celebrate with us that every day we have faced the realities of COVID-19 and we are still here not only seeking to survive, but to thrive. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, um, uh, Dr. Tema. Um, as the parent of a 14-year-old, um, I too have mourned the absence of leisure, of non-homebound leisure, if I could put it that way. Um, and I have seen my own son seek, um, uh, you know, ways to express himself um, that weren't available before. Uh, and I think that is a part of resilience. Um, and I think you're absolutely right that uh, connecting through culture, whatever your culture is, <laughs> um, uh, is has to be a part of moving through this uh, individually and together. Um, we'll now move to our final uh, presentation for, uh, for the session today. Uh, and it's my honor to introduce Dr. Molly Byrne. Uh, Dr. Byrne is a professor of health psychology at the School of Psychology in NUI Galway, where she directs the Health Behavior Change Research Group. Dr. Burns' research aims to improve population health by developing and promoting an evidence-based behavioral science approach to health behavior change interventions. She's particularly interested in chronic disease prevention and management. Dr. Byrne, the floor is yours. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really honored to be a part of this session this morning, the UN Annual Psychology Day. And I'm going to be looking specifically at contributions from health psychology to building back better post pandemic. So many of you may know where Ireland is, but just in case here it is in the center of the universe, actually sitting on the edge of Europe uh, and beautifully located on the Atlantic. So you can see some nice scenes here below. I know we're all a bit deprived of travel right now. So for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk to you first of all about health psychology before the pandemic, 
as looking then at health psychology since the pandemic, so how health psychology has changed its focus over the last year or so, what we can learn then for building back better before finishing with some concluding reflections. So health psychology before the pandemic, many of you will be familiar with health psychology as a discipline in psychology which uses psychological science to promote health, prevent illness and improve healthcare systems. So really health psychologists are interested in the full spectrum of health from full health, uh, moving into exploring sickness, illness and use of healthcare systems. So in the last decade or even 15 years, behavior change research has very much come to the center of health psychological research. Uh, as we all acknowledge that many of the uh, leading causes of morbidity and mortality around the world are behaviorally determined. So if you think about cardiovascular disease, respiratory diseases, cancer, many of these have behaviors such as physical activity, smoking and dietary behavior as some of their main causes. So psychologists, health psychologists are very interested in understanding and predicting these behaviors and developing interventions to try and change these behaviors to promote health. So I direct the Health Behaviour Change Research Group at the National University of Ireland in Galway, and our vision is to improve population health by developing and promoting an evidence-based approach to behaviour change intervention. So just to give you a little flavour of the type of projects we focus on within the group to give you a sense of the work of a health psychologist, I've given you three examples here. So we're carrying out a study which is looking at young adults with type 1 diabetes and trying to develop interventions to improve self-management among this particularly high risk group. In another study, we're working with GPs to uh, assist them in developing a clinical decision support system in order to enable them to better manage uh, their workload in relation to patients with type 2 diabetes. And then in another um, uh, study, we're interested in understanding and improving uh, hand hygiene behaviour in a hospital setting. So these studies just give you a flavour of the types of research that health psychologists uh, have the expertise to contribute to. Since the pandemic started uh, in February, March uh, of 2020, many health psychologists have focused their energies in the direction of trying to inform the policy and practice response uh, to COVID-19. So I'm going to give you very briefly some information about four examples in which health psychologists uh, around the world have contributed to the response to COVID-19. So in the first example, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how health psychologists have advised national governments in the pandemic response. So I'm aware that uh, this has worked differently all across the world, but from my own experience here in Ireland, uh, I can just tell you that from the outset of the pandemic back in March 2020, uh, a behavioural change or a behavioural science advisory subgroup was set up as one of nine uh, critical subgroups to advise our national public health emergency team. So we have met on a weekly basis since the outset of the pandemic. The advisory team is made up mainly of psychologists, social psychologists, health psychologists, uh, and a number of health economists. So we've conducted a range of different activities uh, over the last year, including evidence synthesis. We've conducted some primary research studies, uh, and we've collected data uh, in an ongoing way from survey and qualitative research uh, to inform uh, the policy response. So our group meet on a weekly basis and we develop recommendations to feedback uh, to the main policymakers in relation uh, to the response to the pandemic. So just a couple of very brief examples. Uh, Professor Pete Lunn is a member of our team and Pete, uh, Pete and his colleagues, for example, carried out an online study in which they explored different types of communication materials to try and promote social distancing. And what they found through doing this work 
was that the thought of infecting vulnerable people or large numbers of people were important in motivating social distancing. So this was the type of experimental work that went on in the background to us developing uh, our national materials um, in terms of uh, the, the restrictions needed uh, for the COVID response. Also, another particularly valuable thing that this group was able to do was uh, we collected uh, weekly survey data, nationally representative survey data, uh, to get a sense from the general population about what behaviours people were engaging with, so were they following the recommendations. We collected data about their emotional well-being, so whether they were worried, feeling happy, feeling anxious, and then their views about whether the uh, policy response was enough, could have been stronger, or was too much. So these data were really critical to feedback to uh, the policymakers and to government in terms of informing uh, the national response. The second example then is looking at international teams of health psychologists who've come together to produce guidance to inform the global pandemic response. And here I'm going to draw on an example from the World Health Organization, a particularly useful guidance document on pandemic fatigue. Uh, and uh, this document was pulled together, the guidelines looking to challenge um, or address the problem of uh, countries in which there were very long term lockdowns were required and how to reinvigorate that public health message. And the guidelines which were um, pulled together based on evidence that was synthesized in this area highlighted four key um, important areas which needed to be addressed for the for national responses. So the first was to ensure that you had a good understanding of people so that you were collecting data and that your response was evidence based. Another then was about the actual process. So this was about engaging people as part of the solution. Uh, another was allowing people to live their lives but reduce risks. So this guideline refers to the importance of enabling people to engage in low risk activities that would actually be important for their well-being, for example, participating in activities outdoors. And finally, the importance of acknowledging and addressing the hardship that people experience. So again, this is about how to frame the message to acknowledge the profound impact the pandemic has had on uh, people's lives. Another example here then comes from the UK in which uh, a group of health psychologists came together to create um, an initiative called the Health Psychology Exchange. And I think this has been a particularly good example of uh, a number of health psychologists who've come together to really try and synthesize their expertise and enable it to be put together in a way which can be very uh, translatable into the practice. So the two examples I've given here are about what, what health psychologists can contribute to ensuring that people remain physically active during the pandemic. And then the second one about what we know from health psychology that we can uh, recommend about encouraging hand hygiene in the community. So again, this is a really nice example of very applied knowledge translation from health psychologists. So the third example then is health psychologists synthesizing evidence and making recommendations specifically about the, the COVID vaccination program. So obviously this is, um, COVID vaccinations are currently a uh, very hot topic internationally. And health psychologists have been able to pull together a number of uh, evidence-based guidance documents uh, I've just drawn on one here from, from the National Institutes of Health in the US. And this actually is a really excellent document in terms of evidence-based uh, recommendations around communicating about the vaccination. So they recommend uh, ensuring that the basics of effective communication are met, but also very specifically addressing the what, so addressing uh, the main concerns that people might have, um, around vaccination and making sure that these are addressed in the communication, who, so the need to uh, engage all sectors and tailor to different groups. So for example, 
Older people might need a different strategy uh, from younger people. Uh, immigrants to a particular society might need a particular tailored piece of communication. And then again, focusing on the process, so the how and the importance of co-developing messages uh, with your target audience. And my final example here is health psychologists from around the world collaborating on research to understand the pandemic response. And I think a really excellent exa example here is a research project called Eye Care, so International COVID-19 Awareness and Responses Evaluation Study. So this is a longitudinal study led out by uh, Professor Kim Lavoie and Simon Bacon in the Montreal Behavioural Medicine Centre. They're currently on to their ninth wave of data collection, uh, which has been uh, ongoing since the outset of the pandemic. And they currently have data from over 60,000 people from right across the world, over 175 countries. Uh, and this has allowed the collection of really valuable data in terms of the policy response in different countries around the world uh, and the behavioral response uh, and other emotional responses uh, throughout the pandemic. So this is a really rich data source uh, and I think a really excellent example of international collaboration. So this is just one chart from iCare uh, in which you can see the different pandemic relevant behaviours, mask wearing, hand washing, physical distancing and avoiding gatherings and how these behaviours have changed uh, since March uh, 2020. So what can we learn uh, for building back better? And I've tried to link my thinking on this to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So I'm really just going to highlight two things here. And I think the first is that I think psychologists have a lot to contribute to ensuring we are pandemic ready. So I think there's still more that psychologists can contribute in terms of informing our current response to COVID-19, but also what can we learn to ensure that we have the most evidence-based response for the next pandemic should that happen. And I think a really good example here of people who have come together to try and develop the evidence for our pandemic response looking specifically at behavioural, environmental, social and systems interventions is a group called the Bessie Collaboration, uh, who have been running um, online seminars um, since the outset of the pandemic. And I think this provides a really excellent international forum uh, for uh, moving forward and ensuring that we learn as much as we can from our response to the pandemic this time. The second lesson then is I think we need to look at how we can harness our strengths to apply to other health problems. So I certainly think over the last year, health psychologists have been able to engage in a way that I've never seen before uh, to enable them to take an evidence-based approach to translating their expertise and skills to really inform a policy and practice response. So we've done this, obviously, in the context of COVID, uh, which, um, you know, there's been nearly three million deaths worldwide over the last year. But if we're also then to think about other causes of death, so, for example, from cardiovascular disease, 17.9 million people die each year. And for cardiovascular disease, for example, um, there are many behavioural uh, causes. So what do we know about people's uh, physical activity, their dietary behaviours, and can we harness some of the expertise and knowledge translation infrastructure that has been developed over the last year to apply it to these other chronic illnesses, which are also, um, you know, big killers internationally. So my concluding reflections then are that I think psychology has much to contribute to address the most pressing societal challenges. Over the last year, this has been COVID-19 uh, and this will continue to evolve and change. As psychologists, we must engage to translate our research into practice and policy. And I do think the last year has shown that certainly health psychologists can be very effective in doing this. I think for psychological research, it's important to acknowledge that more funding is needed for this type of research, which still uh, comes into the halfpenny place relative to the amount of funding given to biomedical research. And then I think finally, and crucially to this meeting today, international collaboration is key. 
So thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the discussion. You're on mute, Richard. I made it this far, you know, <laughs> not having that happen. I was just saying, uh, I was just thanking Dr. Byrne, um, not only for reminding us how important international collaboration is moving forward, but, but also showing us how it's happened um, over the past few months, certainly across the research fields uh, in different parts of the, of, of the world. Um, and that just reminds us not only how connected we are to each other, but how we continue, I think, to learn from one another. We'll now move into the question and answer period involving all of our, our panelists. I know we've got a lot of interest. Uh, I'm seeing the numbers below on the, on the Q&A. Um, I have a few questions uh, already that have come through. Uh, and I'll start with a couple questions that are for any and all panelists who want to come forward. So I'll, I'll read it out. And then whoever wants to, to jump in, um, we'll try to manage it that way. So the first question is, from your respective fields in psychology, can you please provide one to two, I'm gonna say one in the interest of time, one concrete recommendation for building back better, especially in lower and middle income countries and low resource communities. So that's one recommendation from your respective fields um, that should inform any approach, policy or regulatory or otherwise, to building back better. Does anyone want to help uh, kick us off in terms of the response to that question? You can just unmic or raise your hand. Dr. Fries, floor is yours. Unfortunately, I say the same thing that I said before. Uh, <laughs> get people to start uh, organizations that help, get people to start companies that help, and get people to be better in terms of particular uh, people who are low in the low income bracket, get them to be better entrepreneurs. Thank you very much. To others, please, Dr. Bears, and then uh, Dr. O'Brien. So I think we need to really rethink the role of, of school and the role of uh, education and what is the role of technology and maybe some of the models that we see in other in places that have less resources such as one room schools with one teacher mixed grades everything that the school of the industrial revolution has gotten rid of but that is very traditional in rural communities through the power of technology maybe it's a way to give a to revisit those approaches through the power of technology as supposed to being stuck to the industrial revolution model that it's this pandemic has proven that it's not working because you cannot take it to the homes. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Tema, over to you. Yes, I'm mindful of the work of the Association of Black Psychologists that in this African centered model has created these healing circles. And I grew up in uh, high school in Liberia, West Africa, and I know in many countries there are not a lot of psychologists. And so having lay led uh, healing circles where people can tell their stories, where they can know about the different ways the distress shows up, and then talking about the ways in which they cope, both those kind of indigenous approaches to healing and also some simple psychological interventions that people can teach even on the lay level. And so healing circles within communities can help us to, to grow and to move forward. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Barron, did you just unmic? So I assume you wanna come in, yes? Yeah, great. So yeah, well, I, I think in terms of building back post pandemic from um, a, a health psychology perspective, I do think that we have managed to show over the last year how successful evidence-based interventions to promote healthy behavior change can be. And certainly uh, the experience in Ireland, and I do think it was like this in other countries as well, is that we have seen an incredible level of solidarity in terms of people really coming together um, for the benefit of others. I mean, very often, particularly if you're looking at the sacrifices that have been made by young people, your 14 year old Richard, you know, he, he has made all of these sacrifices for the, the good of society in general. So. I think it is looking at uh, these types of different motivators for motivating healthful behavior change. 
So it's not just about punishing people or, you know, creating rules. It is very much about generating uh, collaboration and solidarity and goodwill towards the behavior of change. Thanks so much. Dr. Sen, would you like to, yes? Yes, sure. Um, for, for me, I think it's thinking about um, pressure and making sure that governments and communities don't um, swap out issues. Right, that they don't in a particular time think, well, we're just going to forget about everything else um, because now we know about this new thing, um, but rather actually use the best <laughs> of interventions and of, of policies and add, as we get new knowledge, add those new, those new um, concerns to them so that we're simultaneously addressing both, you know, we're addressing racism and violence against women, um, for example, right? We're, we're never thinking we can do one without the other. That's right. I mean, the, the analogy I always use is, um, you know, four-year-olds playing football or soccer, you know, can't just go to where the ball is. <laughs> You've got to cover the whole field. Uh, and I think that's true in the, in the government space um, as well and understand that uh, the rest of the field is absolutely important. So we're going to go to another question now that is um, also for any and all panelists who, who wish to answer and I'll, I'll read it out. This is a question from Cynthia Bryant. Uh, and here's the question. How does institutional bias and injustice impact building back better post pandemic? And again here, if you want to raise your hand or just unmike, Dr. Bryant, over to you. Yes, yeah, so we see the disproportionate levels of uh, psychological distress as it relates to uh, the disparities in uh, deaths from COVID-19. We also see it in terms of the healthcare system. I know often we like to look at racism or discrimination happening out there, but we have to also pay attention to it in here in terms of physical and mental health professionals. Um, and just research looking at uh, people of color when they report their pain it's taken less seriously than if a white person says they're in pain. And so those are the kinds of uh, interventions that we need to develop to not only teach uh, marginalized people how to cope, but to really disrupt uh, racism and other forms of oppression as it relates to even healthcare and to policymaking um, so that we can really shift the tide to be able to identify it, not only out in the world, but within ourselves and to interrupt it. Thank you. Do, uh, Dr. Fries. Um, I, I was just thinking of Kenya at this moment. Uh, in Kenya, uh, as in any other African country, um, the uh, banking system uh, had lots and lots of prejudices against the poor participants in the economic system. And what in Kenya happened was that it became more and more irrelevant that the banks did not care about the poor people. Um, by sending money via M-Pesa, by uh, dealing uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, societies um, that, that uh, lend each other money, et cetera. So in my view, get rid of the institutions or work around them as much as you can. Thank you. Does anybody else want to come in on this question? Well, so, please. So, so we know that you know the higher rise in professions in the world are those that involve computer science and engineering all over the world. Those are, but we also know that most countries, if they do, they start teaching in high school or college. And we know that that's too late because all the research shows us that by second grade, second grade, seven to eight years old, stereotypes are already formed and at least in countries like the US and I don't know how this applies to others we know that there are the minorities and the girls that are not going to go into technical disciplines so if we do want to start making a change into who are going to be designing the technologies of the future that we are all going to be using we need to make sure that we open the door for everyone early on in and that's why I particularly focus on early childhood and I think uh, unfortunately the, the countries what I've seen is the the poorer the countries, the later they start the teaching. And that really needs to be reversed. Excellent, thank you. 
I've got a couple of questions now that are for, that are individually directed, and then we'll go back to the whole panel. Um, and the first one is for Dr. Sen. Um, has your model been tested in countries where the culture may not support women's uh, emancipation and decision making? Um, no, um, and um, so for it to it has been tested, for example, in in Iswatini. Um, so for former Swaziland, um, and, uh, but in universities again, um, and was with very minor adaptations received very well by young women, but it has not been used in, in other countries um, where there might be different um, views. I, basically, I think that the print, some of the principles would probably um, be consistent and then what it would require is collaboration adaptation from the ground up um, with research within that community to see which aspects of um, the, the intervention are actually relevant still which ones are not and creating new content so that would be required Thank, thank you. Um, this next question is for Dr. to uh, Dr. Baron and it's from Vera Sores. Do you think that this collaboration between psychology and government will continue? Could you expand on how this can support the implementation of the sustainable development goals? Yeah, thanks, Richard. And thanks, Vera. Lovely to get that question. I mean, certainly from my own experience, I think that over the last year, I have seen unprecedented levels of psychological science inputting to uh, national and international public responses. So certainly I, I think your, your question is very pertinent, Vera. And at a national level, I certainly am very keen to work with our Department of Health to sustain a behavioral science advisory group, because I think we do have the potential to contribute to development of policy around all sorts of other health related issues. So I think that was what I was trying to refer to in my presentation of sustaining some of those strengths. I think then at an international level, I think societies such as the European Health Psychology Society, other international groups in which psychologists come together, um, I, I think these provide an excellent forum for us to um, develop evidence and develop networks and develop submissions which can go back to international um, policymakers and national governments to inform responses to health related uh, issues, certainly, which I, I think obviously is a very critical um, central UN societal um, challenge and goal. So I think there's lots of potential at both national and international level for behavioral scientists to, to engage um, with that evidence synthesis process and that translation of research then and evidence findings into actually uh, developing policy and delivering practice. Great. Uh, thank you so much. This next question is from uh, Srini Vyas. I apologize if I mispronounced your name, and it's for all panelists or any who, who would like to respond to it. Can the panelists say more about the potentially negative impact of the use of technology that has increased during the pandemic? Anybody want to start? Uh, Dr. Bears, yes. <laughs> I, I'll start. I fully agree with that. Uh, I, although I, you know, I study computer science and I develop technologies, and that's what I do for a living. Uh, there are technologies with capital T doesn't mean anything, and we need to really educate ourselves about what kind of behaviors technologies engage in. And the more educated we are, the more we'll be able to decide if this is technologies we want and we welcome and how or we don't. And I use the, the metaphor of the books. Uh, not all books are good. There's pornography as well that I don't want in my library. And it's the same with technology. And the same, and then I just finished or something, not all the time it's good to read a book. You know, at the dinner table, we don't want books. We want social interactions. And it's the same for technology. And if we start with the children, it's wrong because we need to start with the parents because this generation of parents has not learned how to use technologies in ways that are uh, socially and emotionally responsible. So this is exactly where we need most of the parent education. So then it can go down to the children. Absolutely. Um, do others want to come in on this question? The use of technology. Oh, Dr. Fries, please. I, 
I would love to talk about one issue that I that I'm thinking about a lot. How much do we need all channels of communication more than just talk and video? And what does that imply? What is haptic? What is the what is the embrace? The uh, the the short uh, touch, etc. What does that all imply as well? All these kinds of things we need to bring back into the workplace to actually make it a humane workplace as well. Excellent, thank you. Anybody else on this one? I, I don't see hands, so we'll move, we'll move to the next uh, question, which is from uh, Swati uh, Bajpai. Can you say more about the impact of the pandemic on older persons and considerations as we build back better? Um, anyone want to start us off on this one? Yes, please, go ahead. Uh, the elders, our elders really uh, face a number of challenges and issues. And a big piece is the fear, you know, as we saw early on that being disproportionately affected. And unfortunately, uh, some of the messaging and social responses were very dismissive of seniors, like saying, you know, it only affects them or we don't have to worry about it. Um, and so there is also the high rates of um, isolation and loneliness. And a part of my work is in destigmatizing loneliness. Um, to what you know, loneliness just means is I would like deeper or more social connections than I have right now. And so what it means to live with the fear um, and then the challenges because so much moved into the technology, right? Uh, in some areas where you were told to uh, get tested or, or vaccinated, you needed to sign up online. And so again, that issue of the digital divide and some who are, are trying to figure out what their new normal will look like of saying like, even when it's quote unquote safe, or even if I'm vaccinated, I'm not sure I will ever feel comfortable going out. Um, and the, the challenge of lost time. You know, I know our young people and people in their twenties are like upset they missed a year and that's important to give space for, but what it means in your senior years to feel like you're losing time can be uh, even more devastating. So important to develop ways of building those collaborations. And one of the things many people have been doing is teaching the virtual space to elders and to seniors of having memorial services online, uh, family reunions online, um, and it takes that patience and uh, really connecting to make those things happen. Absolutely. Maybe Dr. Baird, please. Yeah, yeah thanks, Richard. Um, just to maybe come in on another angle from Tamer's uh, contribution there is that in data that we've collected since the outset of the pandemic, where we've looked at different emotional responses to the pandemic, so positive responses, enjoyment, pleasure, um, relaxation, and then negative responses, anxiety, depression, fear, boredom. It's very interesting because right across the whole of the pandemic, older people do much, much better than younger people. So while of course, medically um, and you know, in experiences of sickness and death, older people have suffered disproportionately. However, I think there is um, a real argument to be made for what we can learn from older people in just having more of a perspective, I suppose, about what is important in life. And I know that, you know, in my own personal experience, my own children have learned a lot from their grandfather, you know, who has been able to speak to them about the experience. And I think, you know, they, they at the outset of the pandemic, it was real fear for granddad because, you know, he was at risk and blah, blah, blah. Yet he has been very strong throughout in terms of flipping it back and saying, no, it's actually harder for you. So I think there is something there just in that we can learn from older generations who I, I think have just been much better able to take perspective over the pandemic uh, in terms of what things are important in life. Absolutely. Does anybody else want to come in on this question? I don't see hands. I'm going to group the next two together. Um, just, they're slightly linked, but in the interest of time. Um, the first one is from uh, Jimmy Westerheim. What would be the impact of a digitized version of sharing circles on trauma healing? Could this be a sustainable approach? And the second one is just a bit more broad. What will be the place and lasting 
impact of virtual communication and care, such as telehealth, virtual reality, et cetera, on social development post pandemic? Um, so the specific one, and then the slightly broader round around virtual communication. Does anyone want to go first on those, please? Doug. Just for in terms of the healing circles that they're actually being done currently virtually, uh, there were some that were pre-existing, and then also, as I was mentioning, the Association of Black Psychologists, uh, they created one that started last year in the pandemic. And these are one-time um, only meetings, but they're offered uh, multiple times. So people could attend more than one. And those are called the Sawubona uh, Healing Circles, which is Swahili for I see you. And so um, it is that encouragement of people having safe spaces to connect. And with these platforms, what they're able to do is have breakout groups. And so there is the kind of large part of healing with everyone together, but then so that there is space for everyone to be able to share to the level of their comfort. Uh, and each breakout group has a facilitator. Um, there is a training process, and then there are people who um, have more experience with it, who are kind of mentoring those who are new uh, to the intervention, but the healing circles can definitely be done virtually and they are being done. Excellent, thank you. Does anybody else wanna come in on, on these two? Dr. Barron, please. Yeah, Richard, I, I, if I'm remembering correctly, the second part of the question, which was about using digital platforms for other uh, areas, and I certainly think you know, we have been forced in the last year to move so much online. And, you know, I think we've spent 20 years trying to get cardiac rehab online, you know, and really struggled to do that. So I think there's actually been huge progress in the last year in terms of putting um, a lot of these different programs online. And the benefit of that is that it can open up these programs, it can increase accessibility. Um, and I think from a research perspective as well, um, digital interventions provide us with great opportunities to try and understand uh, how interventions are working and try and tailor interventions to ensure that they're reaching the people who are going to benefit from them most. Um, so I think there's lots of potential for uh, the, the digital platforms to enhance different areas of um, healthcare in particular. Thank you for that. We only have time for one more question, but I, I might just say, just for a small window um, into, into my universe, um, we, uh, for the first nine months of the pandemic, um, we at the UN moved completely, almost completely virtual um, and had to discover uh, platforms. And I have, I have to say, um, when your whole job is reading the room and the room has the camera off, it's really hard to do your job. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's really hard to be an effective um, listener and an effective communicator um, on a digital platform. In some ways, you know, when people are on screen, um, their, their body language is accentuated, um, sometimes unintentionally, sometimes intentionally. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you can't really get the whole perspective because like we have today, you know, at a certain point, we had 760 people participating, but really you're only seeing one person at a, at a time. And so I, I, I tend to think about the, the impact is long lasting, but the impact is not just the platform that we will be uh, using. The impact is also what are the instincts that we develop in engaging with one another on these platforms? Um, how do we respond? Like human interaction is about hearing something, hopefully hearing something, responding to it, you know, another response kind of to, to that. Um, I think the kind of behavioral, so I'm, not, I'm not a scientist, but I think the behavioral scientist based, science based on my experience of the past nine to 12 months is really interesting. Um, and, you know, it's, it's probably a bit too soon to tell how it will impact us kind of over, over time, but I can assure you certainly in, at, at the UN, there is, a, there is a real change and we have to relearn how to do our jobs and try to be effective advocates for our countries and for our, our policies in a whole other way than when I arrived in New York three years ago, um, for sure. Uh, we don't have too, too much more time, so I'm going to ask the last question uh, and then we'll go to the wrap up. Um, and this uh, this actually, sorry, we have two more questions. Um, there's a question from uh, Pavan Kumar Bada, uh, which is a question to all panelists. Any considerations for special needs individuals as we build back? Anyone want to take uh, that one? Okay, so we've got Dr. Sen and then Dr. Brian, or Dr. Brian and then Dr. Sen. <laughs> 
Yes, so uh, one of the strategies that have been really helpful um, for those with special needs is the use of the expressive arts. So those expressive arts interventions that can help uh, with communication and that are manageable and can be both uh, directed expressive arts intervention and interventions and non-directed, uh, whether it is uh, just having the artwork or the instruments out or people utilizing what's in their home. Um, a big one that we have used uh, with special needs children for those um, who are physically able is movement. Um, and so putting the music on even in the virtual platform and allowing uh, us to incorporate that embodied healing because people are holding so much stress in their bodies. And it also incorporates that play. And we encourage it also with family therapy because there can be such like a heaviness to this season. And so play therapy and art therapy are great interventions. Um, thanks very much, Dr. Sen. Sometimes in different circles, we talk about special needs in different ways. And so I'm just gonna sort of say that in terms of interventions, um, for example, the one that I developed, it's really important to make sure that, that they are developed from the ground to work for all of the people in the environment, right? In that environment. So for example, you know, are the materials um, available for, um, for women who are visually impaired? Um, are the physical activities that are being taught appropriate? Can they be appropriately um, redirected and uh, changed on the fly for women with, with different um, uh, uh, abilities, for example? And so this is not, you know, it's talking about special needs children in, in that way, but we always need to make sure that everything is actually inclusive from the ground so that we don't then sort of go, oh, wait a second, there's nobody that, right? And people can't be here and be part of this unless they are able-bodied, um, all of those kinds of things. So we need to really do that from the ground. Thank you. Any, anybody else on, on this question? Yes, please, Dr. Fries. You're on mute, sorry. Unmute yourself. Um, well, just one short answer. Uh, a colleague of mine uh, from uh, Uganda uh, has used the PI personal initiative training with uh, prisoners um, uh, to, to prepare them for the time after they have gone out of the prison. And I think that's a special need kind of group uh, that, that really works extremely well. And it had worked extremely well from the, it wasn't randomized control group design as the other studies, but uh, from, from that perspective. Thank you. Dr. Bears, did I see your hand? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so we've done a lot of work with children with autism, uh, an autism spectrum disorder and the robots and uh, where they really, because programming is about sequencing and there's an order and it's very, and we've, we've and there, I have, if you go to my website, we have a couple of uh, peer review published articles uh, in different countries. And so, you know, uh, that, and that brings uh, everything that Dr. Brian was talking about, play, expression, art. It's just that your expressive tools are different, are technologically rich, but it's the same approach that Dr. Brian was talking about. Thanks very much. Um, so I've got uh, one more question, and this is a question directed to Dr. Sen. Um, what is the role of men in your work or in the work that you described? Sorry. Yeah. So um, my work does focus on women, but as I said, I'm collaborating with, and there is a long tradition of men who are working to end violence against women and who have been, um, so researchers, activists, and so collaborations between all of us, each working on different pieces is what we need. We can't, there is no one thing that we can do and then avoid everything, doing everything else, right? We need to do all of those pieces I described or we're not gonna be able to solve this very difficult problem. So there's great work out there and um, just we have not had the success with effectiveness for um, men's programs to reduce perpetration yet. Great. 
Thank you so much. So we're at the top of the hour here. Um, I'll now pass it over to clo for closing remarks to Dr. Siegel and Dr. Sanbe. But just before doing so, let me just on my own behalf, thank all of the, the panelists um, for their candor, um, for their insights. And let me thank as well the participants for, for your patience uh, and your listening, uh, notwithstanding the technological means that we're uh, trying to leverage to have this conversation. It's been uh, a real delight for me again. All right, uh, Dr. Siegel and Dr. Sanve, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, first, we want to thank uh, all of the missions who have been co-sponsoring us for so many years, including the permanent mission of Palau to the United Nations, the permanent mission of the Dominican Republic to the United Nations, the permanent mission of Mexico to the United Nations, and I want to say that Ambassador Agaita was extraordinary today as a moderator. And obviously, we're going to come back to you again because you've always done such a wonderful job. And I turn it over to Dr. Sambe. It seems as if we started a few minutes ago. So, uh, but as because it wrapped up so quickly, which means uh, we enjoy the program. Um, I have a couple of uh, closing uh, remarks uh, for uh, closing uh, um, comments to respond to some of the attendees. Um, there are questions about uh, the recording. The recording is, uh, uh, there is a recording and um, we are going to get it to you, I am trying to get the uh, Zoom, um, the Zoom uh, te uh, technician on how we can get it to you, but there's a recording and it's posted and we have a web link for that. So you will be able to access the recording of the whole program. There is also a link to um, the bios of all the uh, presenters on the panel, as well as everybody who uh, uh, has everybody who has spoken today, uh, the bios are all in the program, and there is a link to that program too. We will get all of those to to you. Uh, there is also a question about uh, the CEUs, whether there is a CEU for this. Uh, no, there is no CEUs for this. Um, uh, some of you have reached out to us from different countries that uh, you need uh, uh, something to be able to present to get for your professional development. Unfortunately, uh, we didn't uh, we didn't design this uh, for a CEU to be able to earn CEU. We have to uh, get it all approved uh, by different organizations. Uh, so we don't have, uh, we are not offering a CEU, uh, at least this year. We can look at this uh, later on when we do the, uh, the overview of uh, this, pro uh, this year's program with uh, PCUN. And next year we may, we may not, but this year we are not offering a CEU. Um, if it makes any difference for your organization, you can show them the, your participation with the uh, registration and uh, your link to, to it, but we are not offering CEUs. Um, I, and then the, there, was, there were questions about the slides. Uh, we'll check with the presenters if any of them will be uh, open to sharing their slides, we'll get that to you. Uh, but it depends on the presenters, and we have not asked them beforehand. I believe those are the. Um, I believe these are the uh, things I needed to address from uh, the comments and questions from the uh, the audience. Um, thank you so very much to all the uh, speakers. These are all very busy people. And uh, we, PCUN, we don't have enough money to pay you. So, so you are not doing this for pay, but you are doing it, I believe, to advance uh, 
psychology, to advance the profession, but most importantly, to impact people's lives positively. And we thank you so sincerely, uh, Dr. Marina Bass, uh, Dr. Charlie Chen, Dr. Michael Fries, a special thank you to you because it's 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. where you are, uh, Dr. Thema Brand Davis, and Dr. Molly Byrne. Uh, thank you very much for the gift of your time and your expertise. And uh, we hope uh, we can count on you uh, another time. Uh, sincere thank you also to all the attendees from all over the world, um, most especially from Asia, uh, the South Pacific, because some of you are staying up very, very late into the wee hours of the morning to uh, listen to this program. We sincerely thank you and we hope uh, you will join us again uh, next year. I also want to especially thank um, Dr. Ayoko Gaba. Uh, she's behind the scene, but she has been sorting out the questions um, for us and to the APA's uh, psych, uh, psych assistant, uh, Josephine, thank you so very much for all your help uh, with all of this. And of course, to all the people who have helped the co-chairs uh, from the program committee, um, we couldn't have done any of this without you. And lastly, too, uh, the uh, the Canadian ambassador, uh, you did such a wonderful job for us before. We called on you again. You did even a uh, greater job for us today and we'll be calling on you again. That's what happens when you do excellent jobs. Thank you all very much. And uh, we hope to see you next year. Thank you all. This concludes the 14th annual Psychology Day at the United Nations. Thank you all. Goodbye.